We were killing pigs when the Americans arrived. A Tuesday morning, sunlight and gutter blood outside the slaughterhouse. From the main road, they would have heard the squealing, then heard it stop, and had a view of us in our gloves and aprons coming down the hill. Two lines of them, guns on their shoulders, marching. Armoured cars and tanks and open jeeps. Sunburned hands and arms. Unknown, unnamed, hosting for Normandy. Not that we knew then where they were headed, standing there like youngsters as they tossed us gum and tubes of coloured sweets. These words from Seamus Heaney's Anna Horish, 1944, talk of the first encounter of locals with the mighty US Army. Although the speaker, presumably an employee of Gribben's, the Gribben family slaughterhouse, notes that they looked like youngsters. Young men, far from home, about to wage war on occupied Europe. Hosting for Normandy. The All-Americans of the 82nd Airborne Division were billeted and trained in and around Castle Dawson, where Seamus Heaney uh, is from. The almost silent march of brown leather boots and the rustle of khaki uniforms would have been new sounds within the Anna Horish townland, and yet in many areas of Ulster, like here in Lisburn, the population was, by 1944, no stranger to the American soldier. I'm Scott Edgar from Wartime NI. As you've heard, it's an online portal. It's also a podcast and a YouTube channel, if that's your thing. And it's dedicated to telling the story of Northern Ireland during the Second World War. On my last visit here, I spoke about Lisburn during the Second World War, recounting stories of the men on the memorial, of local lives and of air crashes and accidents in the area. And I had a couple of people concerned that I was just going to do the same thing again. Would I, would I do that to you? Today, the focus is on 1944, in the weeks leading up to the Allied invasion of Normandy. So we're going back almost 80 years to the day. Ulster was preparing for D-Day, for the Allied invasion of Europe. Across Lisburn, a number of women waited anxiously for news of their loved ones. Would they be part of the invasion plans? Would they make it? Would they be home by Christmas? These women, like many others across Ulster, had been swept off their feet wowed by tall athletic men in khaki, thrilled by speeding jeeps, marching boots, dances, dinners, and accents new to the Irish ear. These women had courted and married, not Americans, but Welshmen. 53rd Welsh Division formed on the 1st of September, 1939, under Major General Bevel Wilson. And after initial training in Wales, the first elements of the division were in Northern Ireland by October 1939, little over a month after the Second World War began. There, the division came under the command of British troops in Northern Ireland, an overall command based here at Thiepful Barracks in Lisburn. The memoirs of a member of the Auxiliary Territorial Service, who we will come back to later, uh, describe the Lisburn Barracks, although not in very favourable terms. These are her words, not mine. Yes, they are grim. Not my line at all. Or any of us for that matter. Totally unlike the freedom in our man. We are chivied in and out all day and need chits for every damn thing. So that taking an overnight pass to stay in Billy's hut at Drum is a positive holiday. I'm in the Sandhurst block, one of the camp's ghastly red brick monstrosities that house us troops, male and female. We're on the third floor, the men on the fourth and second, the ground floor, the mess. Each room holds eight, more if pushed, doors opening to a jail-like corridor to bathrooms, its windows overlooking the barracks' square ugliness. The bedroom windows do at least look out on perimeter grass and trees. The noise in the vast mess we have to share with the men is ear-splitting. Army boots cracking the floor like sledgehammers, metal trays and food containers crashing and clattering ceaselessly, Plates and cutlery shattering and clunking on and off the tables. You can't hear yourself think. And eating can't start until all twelve sit at the table. The least said about the food, the better. But here we go. Greasy stew floating with pale grey dumplings of heavy as lead dough. Carrots, carrots, carrots. Turnips, 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 which I am sick of. So I swap carrots for beans, beans, beans that everyone else is fed up with. Lumpy rice and similar ilk puddings complete the menu. We withdraw, that's the only word for it, as fast as possible to soothe our taste buds with more refined fare. Cream cheese on a cracker or a slice of bread purloined from the mess. 
or better still, a hunk of malty vita bread that we buy from a Lisburn baker. Following the Dunkirk evacuation in May 1940, the threat of a German invasion of the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland, was at the forefront of people's minds. Other infantry divisions soon joined the Welsh in Northern Ireland, with the 53rd Division tasked then with the defence of the southern half of Ulster under the command of three corps. While based in Northern Ireland, the division undertook exercises, training at battalion, brigade and division level. In November 1941, the division returned to the Welsh border counties again, having experienced much in the way of wartime life in Northern Ireland, including helping to clear up, rescue survivors and tend to the dead and dying following the Belfast Blitz. Wartime records note, it was a very different 53rd Division which returned to near its own countryside in November 1941 from the comparatively untrained one which had moved to Ireland in driblets between October 1939 and April 1940. Many of the Welsh soldiers returned to their homeland, having married local women, several of whom were from the Lisburn area. Among the Welsh battalions with local connections was 6th Carnarvonshire and Anglesey Battalion, the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, who formed part of 158th Infantry Brigade. After their time in Ulster, they continued to train and eventually joined 21st Army Group on the 15th of May 1943. The next year would see intensive training for these Royal Welsh Fusiliers as they prepared for the Allied invasion of Europe. By 1943, the Northern Irish ear had grown accustomed to American accents too. The first contingent had arrived on the 26th of January 1942 and by late 1943, thousands more embarked on Irish shores to begin the final build-up for Operation Overlord. To help the new arrivals adjust to life in Northern Ireland, each received a copy of the Pocket Guide to Northern Ireland issued by the Special Service Division in Washington, D.C. This small book contained a vast amount of information. It was part tourist guide, part etiquette handbook, some parts referred to customs and traditions now outdated over the course of more than eight decades, but other information relating to bad weather, poorly seasoned food, and a lack of Sunday entertainment may still hold true. So I'm gonna read you a bit from the pocket guide that was given to all American soldiers arriving in Northern Ireland. This is quite long, but it's a really good overview of what life was like in 1942. For example, under the heading, the people, their customs and manners, the following may still be cons considered good advice. The people of Ulster, whether Gaelic, Scottish or English ancestry, regard themselves as Irishmen. They are proud of their lineage and tremendously fond and proud of either native land. They will talk to you freely. Before you've been there many days, you will hear all about Ireland's long history, the beauty of Ireland's scenery, the extraordinary goings-on of the Irish fairy folk, the prodigious roll call of Ireland's great men. Your role is to listen. You may have seen more exciting scenery, you're undoubtedly used to more bountiful living, but you are on their home grounds. They may expect you to brag about New York's big buildings, don't do it. There are Irish men who emigrated to the United States as boys and who have returned near the end of their lives to the little villages that they left long ago. Some of them are unpopular because they talk about skyscrapers, express highways, modern plumbing. They boast about the wonders they have seen and shared. The Irish being proud people resent comparisons in which Ireland comes off second best. The Irish will like your frankness if it is friendly. They will expect you to be generous, high-spirited, robust, but they will not appreciate any effort of yours to impose your code of conduct or values upon them. A visitor coming to America wins few friends if he makes a point of telling Americans how much better his country is than theirs. It doesn't make any difference that, the honest, that he honestly believes he is right. The Irish like their own way of life and you will be wise if during your stay you fit yourself into it as well and as comfortable as possible. The people of Ulster are in general serious-minded and hard-working. They are independent in their... Sorry, I tried to do that sentence without laughing there, but we're very serious-minded and hard-working. Uh, they are independent in their beliefs and stubborn in their opinions. Uh, the heavy infiltration of Scotch blood may have something to do with the fact that they are exceedingly thrifty, but they are thrifty also because Ireland is not a rich country and a living is difficult to come by. The Ulster man likes to drive a hard bargain in business affairs and he thinks a spendthrift is a dope. Yet at the same time, Ulster is a most hospitable place. If you pause at a farmer's house, you're likely to be invited in for a cup of tea. Tea is now rationed, but recently an American soldier speaking on a shortwave broadcast said, 
He had drunk more tea during his first two weeks in Ireland than he had in his whole life before. You should be warned on one point. If you're invited into the farmer's dinner table, don't accept too many helpings. Food is not plentiful, and because the Irish are hospitable, the bustling housewife may have cooked most of the week's supply of meat. The male social centre in Ulster is the tavern or public house. While there are temperance advocates and few prohibitionists in Ireland, you won't see much of them. Irish whisky is famous, but the price is now so high that you will find most people drink stout, ale and porter, which they call beer. The American type of beer, which of course is really the German type, comes only in bottles and is known as lager. Up in the hills you may be offered an illicit concoction known as pochine. This is a moonshine whisky made out of potato mash. Watch it, it's dynamite. The beer and ale served in the pubs is usually heavier and stronger than ours. Don't expect ice cold drinks. The Irish, like Europeans generally, are accustomed to drinks served at room temperature. They like them that way. The Irish don't go in for the Dutch treat system, so if five men enter a pub, each will stand around and etiquette demands that they all stay until the last of the five rounds has been bought. If you're invited to join such a group and do so, remember that you will give offence by refusal to treat and be treated. You will probably miss soda fountains, hot dog stands and hamburger joints of America. Ireland has nothing remotely like them. There are no sodas, few sweets and very few soft drinks. If you want a sandwich, you'll have to make your own. The Irish serve, their, serve and eat their meat and bread separately. As a matter of fact, when on furlough, you may have difficulty in getting a hot meal just when you want it. Most pubs don't serve food. And in the country, it's quite all right to approach a farmhouse and ask to buy milk, eggs, bread and tea. The war has made it necessary for Ireland to rely on her own produce for food, and there is not much variety. Potatoes and cabbage are the inevitable vegetables. There is little seasoning in the food, and the beef or bacon may be a bit on the tough side, but it satisfies a hungry man. There are various specialties that you'll find delightful. The oat cakes and potato bread are excellent, and the scones, that's baking powder biscuits, are the best in the world. The pre-war tourist frequently remarked in criticism of Ulster that there was nothing to do there. And it is true that the Irish do not go in for organised sport as much as the, uh, as the English do, or as much as we do. But you'll rarely see anything more exciting than a football or soccer game between two tough Irish professional teams. Tempers rise and the police are frequently on hand to keep order. Both dog racing and horse racing are popular. All field sports are popular and you might be able to get permission from a farmer to shoot over his land or to trout fish in his brook. But make sure you get permission Poaching is not popular in Northern Ireland. Golf is not a rich man's game in Northern Ireland and there are links everywhere. Your commanding officer can undoubtedly arrange for you to play the nearby Irish courses. There is virtually no nightlife. Pubs close early and the floor show and juke joint are non-existent. You'll find motion picture houses, cinemas in all the larger towns and many American films are shown. Theatres are closed on Sunday. In fact, everything is closed on Sunday because of the devout church-going habits of the population and the strict, uh, strict laws. In the matter of Sunday clothing, uh, closing, in other matters of morality and personal conduct, the Irish may seem puritanical to men used to America's free and easy ways. You will do well among respectable householders to avoid even mild profanity. What passes for idle swearing among Americans may strike as real blasphemy and therefore offensive. Anything which borders, however faintly, on the indecent is better left unsaid. You're more than welcome in Irish churches. Nothing will establish friendlier relations between you and the Ulster people than going to church with them. Freedom of worship is guaranteed everywhere in Ireland and Britain, just as in the United States. In America, as you know, we usually take it for granted that some people go to one church and some to another. The Irish, where religion is concerned, take nothing for granted. Church affiliation is a serious thing. There are 430,000 Roman Catholics in Ulster, 390,000 Presbyterians, 345,000 members of the Church of Ireland, 55,000 Methodists and 60,000 of other faiths. Religious differences and political differences are inseparable in Ireland and they have been made one and the same by years of internal bitterness, strife and violence. You will discover that Protestants usually do not mingle with Catholics nor Catholics with Protestants. They move in quite different circles socially and they have few contacts, even in business. Do not try to bridge this chasm. Wiser and better people than you have discovered that Ireland is one place where intervention is not blessed, however well intended. In summing up, 
Religion is a matter of public as well as private concern in Ulster, and you'll be wise not to talk about it. In America, where do you come from? We ask. In Ulster, they ask, what church do you belong to? If that question is put to you, tell the truth and change the subject. So that was a very long piece there, but I think it's really valuable in giving you an insight into what Northern Ireland as a whole and what certainly Lisburn and the surrounding area would have been like. Um, so that is from 1943. Among the many bases and camps used by American troops in Northern Ireland, the nearby Wilmot House at Lady Dixon Park in Dunmurry was one of the most important. On the 28th of January 1942, so that's only two days after the first US GI stepped ashore in Belfast, headquarters of the United States Army Northern Ireland Force op opened at Wilmot House. The house had already seen use as a base for British troops before American troops arrival and records estimate that 290 men could have been at the Wilmot base from 1942. On the same day, United States Army Forces British Isles opened a subordinate signal office at the Dunmurray site. Colonel Floyd T. Gillespie and Staff Sergeant Joel M. Hirsch oversaw this operation. The United States Army 63rd Signal Battalion provided the men, and from Wilmot, the US Army established radio channels to Iceland. Transmitters, receivers and teleprinters made up some of the equipment used. On the 9th of February 1942, so just over a week later, 112th Engineer Battalion began to expand the site. Well-constructed blast walls protected the doors and windows of Wilmont House. The men stayed in Nissen huts around the gardens and Quonset huts acted as administration buildings. Completion of this section of the base took place on the 27th of February. A few months later, in April that year, another engineer battalion arrived and carried out even more construction work, making the site larger and larger again. The new bills included more Nissen huts for accommodation and an anti-aircraft gun emplacement. The work finished in May 1942, and the Dunmurray site by then held 184 officers, 641 enlisted men, and 17 Red Cross American personnel. There was much reorganization of troops at Dunmurray during the United States Army time at Wilmot House. Uh, it became headquarters of Northern Ireland Base Command on the 1st of June 1942. And this restructuring led to the base becoming the Permanent Area Command Headquarters in Northern Ireland. So it's, it's quite, quite an important site and it's, for me, I think, going somewhere like Wilmot House now, it's just great to look around and, you know, can you imagine what those numbers, 641 enlisted men, 184 officers, this was the, the number one base for the US Army at the time. At the same time, US Army uh, V Corps established a headquarters at Wilmot House. This lasted only a short time before they moved on to Brownlow House, Lurgan, um, on the 8th of June, 1942. In Dunmurray, Brigadier General Leroy P. Collins was the most senior officer. Colonel Levy acted as his chief of staff. By November 1942, most of the first American GIs to land in Northern Ireland had moved on. So the first um, contingent of US troops that arrived here were training for what would become Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa in 1942. A small number uh, of troops had remained to take care of administration and supplies and to complete construction projects. Um, and of course the communications continued from Wilmot House. In 1943 a second wave of American troops arrived in Northern Ireland. The number of GIs led to the reactivation on the 5th of October 1943 of Northern Ireland Base Section, again under Brigadier General Leroy P. Collins. General Supply Depot was opened at Northern Ireland District Headquarters at Wilmont, and it came under the command of Colonel Erwin S. Dierking. Um, so this, this supply depot um, was a centre for people and soldiers in quartermaster regiments and we'll come on to some of those. By May 1944, so we're talking almost exactly 80 years ago today, uh, most of the United States Army forces were bound for D-Day preparations. Uh, District 36 um, at Wilmot House in Dunmurray was the last one remaining in Northern Ireland and it retained communication facilities until June 1944 when once again the base relinquished its headquarters role and fell under the command of Western Base Section Headquarters. 
From 1942 to 1944, Wilmot House had been a vital part of the US Army's base in Northern Ireland. Now, very little remains of the site to show its wartime importance or technological prowess. Tourists enjoy peaceful walks and stunning views of ornate gardens. And like I said, you can only imagine the scenes there during the 1940s. And it is a shame to watch the old house left to decay and crumble. On the 11th of May, 1944, at 34 Malone Park, an American woman put pen to paper as her country folk prepared for the upcoming invasion. Her name was Helen Ramsey Turtle, and she had moved from her native state of Colorado, USA, to the homeland of her husband, Lancelot Turtle. She wrote, having recently moved from Mahi Island to Belfast while undergoing medical treatment. And I was very fortunate to chat to Helen Ramsey Turtle's daughter, uh, Julie Mackey, um, last year, uh, which is where I've got this information from. And all of her wartime letters have been published in a book entitled Midnight Again. On the 11th of May, 1944, she wrote, I'm still outside and it must be nearly 11. We've each had a glass of real lemonade, divine. It will soon be dark now. We hardly black out at all, and the move, or the flitting as it is called here, has certainly taken our mind off the news and the second front. When I see a convoy of Americans, my heart constricts. I think that is the word. Stella was skin and bones weeks ago. She must be just bone and hair now because her American beau and whether he may be going or when he may be going. I still hope it will be all over bar the shouting, done by bombing. The Stella in question was Stella Robbins Carr, a wife of renowned uh, artist Tom Carr. At the time, the couple were experiencing some marital problems and Stella had been, to quote, uh, stepping out for some time with a United States Army captain from Chicago, Illinois. Around this time, Northern Ireland was absolutely bustling with American service personnel, a peak of around 130,000 in total. Estimates suggest that a total of 300,000 passed through Northern Ireland between January 1944 and the end of the Second World War. In America, General George S. Patton gave uh, one of his rousing speeches. In Lurgan, General Russell P. Hartle was in command at Brownlow House, and in Bangor, future President of the United States of America, Dwight D. Eisenhower, was preparing to address a vast armada of American and British shipping in Belfast Lock. It was almost time. A month after the previous letter, Helen Ramsey Turtle again wrote to her mother and sister back in Denver, Colorado. This letter, dated the 11th of June 1944, talks of the radio broadcasts and the excitement they brought. Particularly, it appears to Helen's sister-in-law, Arabella. She writes, D-Day was so exciting. We missed the first announcement at 9.30am, but I was vaguely listening at 10.30 when I heard an announcement that the King was broadcasting. I was just about to wonder when, and Elle rang up to say that, as they say here, the balloon has gone up. Gordon came in a minute later, and then Arabella. They decided not to go on the 12 o'clock train, but wait until the 5.15 so that they could hear the news. We listened at 12, and Arabella kept talking the whole way through the news until I could have screamed. Uh, the person you can see on the screen there is the veteran BBC presenter John Snag. Uh, so it was he who announced communique number one at 9.32 a.m. on the 6th of June, 1944. And that was relayed across the BBC News Network. An hour later came the recap, and that is the one written about by Helen Ramsey Turtle there and talked over by the excited, the excited sister-in-law, Arabella, as the family huddled around their wireless set at 34 Malone Park. This is London. London calling in the home, overseas and European services of the BBC and through United Nations Radio Mediterranean. And this is John Snag speaking. Supreme Headquarters, Allied Expeditionary Force, have just issued communique number one, and in a few seconds I will read it to you. Under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces, supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. I'll repeat that communique. Communique number one. Under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces, supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. This is the BBC Home Service. 
And here is a special bulletin read by John Snag. D-Day has come. Early this morning, the Allies began the assault on the northwestern face of Hitler's European fortress. The first official news came just after half past nine, when Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force, usually called SHAPE from its initials, issued communique number one. This said, Under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces supported by strong air forces began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. On D-Day itself, the 6th of June 1944, Sergeant John James or Jack Caves was one of thousands of men bound for landing Zone N east of the Orne River near the small town of Ranville. He served in 1st Glider Pilot Regiment. Sappers had cleared the area of obstacles, allowing the arrival of 112 horse gliders and 30 Hamel car gliders. On board the gliders, piloted by men such as Caves, were members of 6th Airborne Division, including 1st Battalion Royal Ulster Rifles. Uh, Royal Ulster Rifles are a very notable uh, unit on um, D-Day itself, as they are the only British Army Regiment to have both of their primary battalions involved on D-Day itself. So 1st Battalion parachuted in in the early hours of the morning in and around uh, the Conn Canal, and 2nd Battalion arrived bit after lunchtime on D-Day on uh, Seward Beach. The landing zones were a hive of activity. Parachutes littered the fields, becoming tangled in tank tracks, and soon there were more gliders than there were spaces to land. To go into the tactics and logistics of a military operation like this would be a whole talk, or maybe two or three. Um, so let's just say, suffice to say, Operation Mallard, in which caves played a part, was a success. Um, and 6th Airborne Division's position was strengthened in the area with additional soldiers, transport, artillery and tanks required for the Battle of Normandy. And were the excitement and danger of Normandy and D-Day not enough, Sergeant Caves' B Squadron of No. 1 Wing Glider Pilot Regiment also took part in the infamous Operation Market Garden in September that year. But that's a talk for another day. On D-Day, Romy Lampkin was in Lisburn. Romy was a Dubliner enlisted in the Auxiliary Territorial Service. She had been based at Thiepful and at Drum House and was a regular visitor to Wilmont. In her memoir, simply entitled My Time in the War, the names of Americans such as her boyfriend Joe or British soldiers like her good friend Long Legs feature often. But she was alone when riding in Lisburn as the Allies landed in France. She writes, Extra, extra, extra. June the 6th, D-Day. It has happened at last. My heart has beaten like a slow drum in my chest the whole day without cease since we heard the news. A most extraordinary reaction. It probably is not extraordinary at all. It is thinking who is on the landing beaches. Some getting killed this instant. Men we've danced with maybe. Long legs. He's sure to be there. The beach landing party expert. History and a half. The air feels electric. Everyone is buoyed up out of their ordinariness. You can feel it zinging through their veins as well as your own. The newspapers blaze inch high black headlines. Invasion. Reading Romy's memoirs, we never learn Long Legs' name. She met him on his birthday, dancing in the Manhattan Club in Belfast. And she wrote this of their first meet. I quite like the birthday lieutenant too. Even if I did keep tripping over his gangling legs, I christened him long legs there and then. He was merry, but not tight and funny as well, telling me that he was a vicar's son from Jamaica and girls, meaning me, should be very aware of vicar's sons. Long legs was no great admirer of the Americans. The following excerpt from Romy's memoir contains language that today would be considered inappropriate, but was common terminology in 1944. She writes, on mass at dances and such, none of us cared for the Yanks too much, certainly not their attitude to their own coloured troops. I've liked the Negroes I've talked to when waiting about for my passengers in their camps, but I was really taken aback when one told me he had never spoken to any white girl before me. To our utter disgust, the Ulster Hall has now put up a no coloured troops notice. We won't go there again, I can tell you. Now officially, there was no colour bar in Ulster, but among some communities, white American officers held sway and enforced their own racist views. During the Second World War, racism was rife within the United States Army, with black soldiers still serving in segregated units. 
On the 18th of October 1943, one such unit, part of 303rd Quartermaster Railhead Company, arrived at Wilmot House in Dunmurray. Part of the company was also at Derrymore House in Bestbrook, and they stayed there until the 4th of May 1944. In 1942, black soldiers in Northern Ireland were, to quote one such soldier, living the happiest days of their lives. And one story that is often recounted. One afternoon, one of the soldiers came into the shop in the village and the young lady asked, Sir, what can I get you? The soldier wondered who she was talking to as he was the only person in the shop. I'm sorry, he said, it's just that no one has ever called me sir before. Being black, I've been called many names, but never sir. With the murder of a black American soldier by a white American soldier in 1942 and the murder in Belfast committed by a black American soldier in 1944, tensions arose and relationships strained. While American soldiers expressed jealousy at how the girls in Northern Ireland were dancing and stepping out with black soldiers, one Unionist MP took things a step further, suggesting that it was only Catholic girls who would stoop so low as to carry on with coloured troops. As previously mentioned, many of the black soldiers based across Ulster served in the Quartermaster Corps. Between December 1943 and May 1944, you will notice May 1944 cropping up as the final date for a lot of these American units, 328th Quartermaster Bakery Company was at Wilmot House. On the 1st of July 1944, they landed on Utah Beach, where they operated alongside 3029th Quartermaster Bakery Company, who had arrived the previous day. Within a matter of days, both companies working together produced around 60,000 loaves of bread each day for the United States Army in the area. By the 20th of July 1944, the number of Quartermaster Bakery Companies in Normandy had grown to 20. And in his record of quartermaster activities, Brigadier General Andrew T. McNamara wrote, So this is about the bakery company who had been based in the Lisburn area and arrived in Normandy about a month after D-Day. One week later, on July 3rd, 1944, while in my office van at our headquarters, then at Lacombe, I noticed a convoy of trucks approaching on the road, and as it grew closer, I recognised that there were large canvas signs on the lead vehicles. As the convoy passed, I was able to read them. They said in substance, Little John and McManus's secret weapon, and under another line, courtesy 3029th QM Bakery Company. This was followed by another convoy bearing similar signs, all of which was owing to the courtesy of 3028th Quartermaster Bakery Company. I sent for the two company commanders and they reported shortly thereafter. After making it clear that neither the contrivances of Messrs Little John or McManus, nor the courteousness of either company or its members would be further advertised openly within First Army area, I asked the two commanders how soon their bakeries could go into operation. They replied cheerfully that they would have their first batch of bread ready for issue in 48 hours. The following day was the 4th of July and I was determined that the American troops in Europe knew that the Quartermaster Corps had not forgotten the importance of this date. I explained to the two officers that our Class 1 truckloads in Omaha Beach would commence issuing rations on the following morning at approximately 8 o'clock and the rations for issue on that day would include fresh bread. This was done. Some bakers may have worked overtime that night, but the troops ate fresh bread on July 4th. While we'd been in England, we had been used to the brown bread that food conservation had required to be an exclusive production in the British Isles. It was nutritious, but not nearly as good as plain white bread. When you haven't seen white bread, fresh white bread for a long time, it not only looks good and smells good, but it tastes good. Therefore, I went to the bakery companies on that first morning and asked for the first sheaf of loaves to be cooled. I took this sheaf over to the nearest hospital and presented it to the commanding officer for his patient's meals that day. I kept one loaf and asked him to arrange for me to see a wounded soldier whose morale might be bucked a little by a loaf of warm bread. He took me to such a man to whom I presented the loaf and a certificate saying, this is the first loaf of bread baked by the United States Army on the continent of Europe certified to this 4th day of July, 1944. This certificate was signed Omar N. Bradley, Lieutenant General, U.S. Army. The soldier smelled the bread, fondled it with his hands, and over the oxygen tubes fastened to his nose, he murmured, boy, if we could eat like this all the time, everything would be all right. Leaving him with the loaf of bread clutched to his chest, 
I departed from the hospital with the knowledge that certainly one American would think well of the Quartermaster Corps on that day. It was with great sadness that I learned several days later the man had died. It's quite a story and for me this was something I accidentally found in an archive and it just really reinforced to me that D-Day, the battle for Normandy, it's not all about beach landings, it's not about the action that you see in Private Saving Private Ryan or Band of Brothers, it's about men out there wanting comforts of home, it's about men making loaves of bread um, and for me really that's about the uh, first American loaf of bread in uh, liberated Europe, um, perhaps, inadvertently making its way from Lisbon. So while it's important to remember the events of D-Day and with the 80th anniversary approaching, that story, as I've said, reinforces that the battle was not just fought and won in a single day. Remember, that was from the 4th of July, so almost a month later. Official recorded dates outline the Normandy campaign as lasting from the 6th of June 1944 to the 30th of August 1944. And that is a total of two months, three weeks and three days. Earlier we left our story with, do you remember 53rd Welsh Division? Uh, they were beginning preparations within 21st Army Group back in May 1943. A little over a year later, it's their time to join the fray. The division wasn't part of the first wave to land on the Normandy beaches, but on the 25th of June 1944, that's D-Day plus 19, 158th Infantry Brigade, including the soldiers of 6th Battalion Royal Welsh Fusiliers, landed at La Riviere on Gold Beach. On moving inland, they replenished 15th Scottish Division who had battered through enemy lines during Operation Epsom. Having completed this relief by the 2nd of July 1944, the division next prepared for Operation Goodwood. During the fighting, 53rd Division captured the town of Caille, but at great cost, sustaining heavy losses against heavy enemy counterattacks, including one particularly heavy attack from 10th SS Panzer Division on the 21st of July. In Lisburn, the week commencing the 16th of July 1944 would plunge three families into mourning. At three, Barnsley's Row, Abigail or Abby Somerville, nee Linus, and her two young daughters, Lorna and Rita, mourned the loss of their husband and father, Fusilier John Somerville. He died during fighting on the 16th of July, aged 26 years old, and is buried in Banville La Campagne. The following day brought the death of Fusilier Ernest Alfred Williams, husband of Margaret Armita Williams, nee Harvey, of Myrtleville on the old Hillsborough Road. The Lisburn Standard on the 1st of September 1944 reported, Fusilier Ernest Alfred Williams, Royal Welsh Fusiliers, husband of Mrs. Meta Williams of Myrtleville, Hillsborough Old Road, Lisburn, who was previously reported missing, is now known to have been killed in action in July in Northwest Europe. His widow received the official notification of his death on his 27th birthday, 28th of August. He had been in the army for over four years. Writing to Mrs. Williams, his major in the course of his letter said, he was a very good soldier, liked by all of us, and on behalf of the company, I extend to you our deepest sympathy. The aforementioned attack by 10th SS Panzer Division also caused the death of Fusilier Deadwood Douglas Adlam, husband of Sally Adlam, near Redmond of 12A Seymour Street. He's also buried in Banville La Campagne. On the 18th of August 1944, the Lisburn Standard reported, Many people in Lisburn, particularly in the Seymour Street area, who know Mrs. D.D. Adlam, formerly Miss Sally Redmond of 12A Seymour Street, have been deeply grieved to learn that her husband, Fusilier Deadwood Douglas Adlam, Royal Welsh Fusiliers, has been killed in action. The late Fusilier was the son of Mr. and Mrs. G.F. Adlam of Carnarfon in Wales, his father serving in the last war as a sergeant major. Before joining up, Fusilier Adlam was employed as a PSV driver. He was aged 25 years and had been in the army six years, having joined from the territorials. Fusilier Adlam's headstone in France bears the inscription, Not a day do we forget you in our hearts. You are ever near as we loved you. And 80 years on, the memories, the mourning, the commemoration and the celebration of liberty for Europe remains as near as ever. 
I hope that this evening has given you an insight into what life was like in Northern Ireland, some of the people who were here, and the role that Lisburn, like many other cities, towns and villages across Ulster and beyond, played in what proved to be the beginning of the end for Hitler in Europe. I would like to thank Lisburn Historical Society and local museums and all others amongst us who organise events such as this, who hold exhibitions, open days, who gather oral histories and play any part in preserving this important part of Ulster's history. And thank you very much for having me along this evening. Thank you. We have Scott Ray Spence from the Ulster Aviation Museum. Oh, you know about Ernie Crommie and the work he did for the US Army Air Force. Yeah. I'm hoping to continue with that work now and to get more involved in it. Um, I've made a few remarks on your website and also on your uh, site. Um, some of the things have been very interesting. Um, there is so much on our doorstep that we just don't know anything about. You know, I go out and about most weeks finding stuff and I'm surprised by what is actually here in Lisbon. You know, I mean, all right, we're based at the old uh, RAF Long Cash, and there's so much on the route, you know, about, out and about around it. I came across a, a wartime building which is actually in the middle of the, um, the golf course at Lisbon Golf Course. Okay. It's still sitting there, still from World War II, still drawings on the wall from it. And I've asked many a time with the golf club to say, you know, what are you going to do with it? And they say, well, we're using it for storage. But it's such a pity to lose these completely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's surprising what there is out there. Yeah, there, there are thousands of, uh, thousands of buildings, of structures um, still out there. Um, one thing that I would uh, recommend, if, if anybody is interested in going out and about and I'm poking around. Um, my my girlfriend absolutely hates going for a drive with me, uh, you know, on a weekend. Because as soon as I spot a bit of crumbling red brick or you know a big slab of concrete, I'm away. Um, but um, Dr. James O'Neill, uh, who uh, works at the uh, NI War Memorial Museum, um, has done extensive work on a defence heritage map of Northern Ireland. Um, I don't have the link for it offhand, but you can find it through through my website or through a podcast that I recorded um, with him. I've been shocked by the amount of um, war graves you know that we have in in Northern Ireland as well. And Commonwealth War Graves uh, Commission don't seem to have anyone in charge in. In Scotland, yeah. So there's no one actually in Northern Ireland. Uh, so our, our closest, I think, is kind of West Scotland, Lanarkshire. Um, Scott, Scott, you me you mentioned um, assets remain as buildings which were still here from the war. Could you give some examples in this part of what those buildings or remains might be or where they are? I'm I'm fairly sure there is an air raid shelter in, in Castle Gardens, um, and I, I work in Bangor, and I know the Castle Gardens one is very similar to one that is in Ward Park in Bangor. And it's kind of recently been been discovered that it wasn't an air raid shelter; it was um, uh, like a, a reporting post for the air raid precautions ARP wardens. Um, so it was a recording centre that they used, but built very much like an air raid shelter. Uh, as I said, I, I'll, I'll try and find that link and, and send it on, um, and maybe you know you could put it up on on social media and things if uh, if people want to explore that map. Um, there are several buildings and things out around the kind of Long Cash uh, airfield. Unfortunately, you can't always get in uh, to see that. Um, I've been putting the spot on trying to think of what else is is around, particularly around Lisburn, but. Things out there include air raid shelters, pillboxes. If you ever want to take a trip down the River Ban, um, I, I was born and raised in Portadown, and just working from Portadown out towards Guildford and, and Scarva, following the line of the River Ban, there are maybe about a dozen concrete pillboxes still standing there. Um, some of them in much better condition than others. Some of them have cows scratching themselves up against them. Some of them have graffiti inside them, and empty beer cans and bottles and others have been taken on by local councils and, and preserved and are kind of restored as almost uh, memorials to, to the time. 
when you were talking specifically around Liz Byrne, but how many American bases were there in Northern Ireland? Uh, there were bases in all six counties, um, so Wil Wilmot House in Dunmurry and uh, Brownell House in Lurgan were the two biggest U.S. Army bases. Um, U.S. Navy were heavily based up around Derry, Londonderry, um, up around the port at Lissa Halley there. Um, but in just, it, it's so hard to know. Um, there is a published document, but even the, the U.S. Army who, who have published this document, which is a station list, they acknowledge themselves that this is far from complete. And you also have great issues as well with local people telling Americans the names of places. So then you have to read what the, you know, what an American officer has written down and backwards try and work out what a local person told him in order to get that name written down on a piece of paper. Um, but there, there were hundreds, you know, a total of 300,000 US troops coming through Northern Ireland and they were billeted all over the place. They, they didn't always have large camps like at, at Wilmot House or at Brownlow House. Sometimes they were in orange halls. Sometimes they were in a classroom of a school. Sometimes they were in Nissen huts out, out in a field, but, you know, behind a, a farmstead. Um, great places to, to look are around old manor houses because um, a lot of those were kind of in, in, in kind of crumbling conditions, let's say, by the 1940s. Um, and often the officers would have stayed in the big house. So that this is what happened at Wilmot House, the officers in the big house and soldiers out in Nissen huts or tents or Quonset huts in the grounds. Um, so you can go out to like Wilmot House, Derrymore House in, in Bestbrook as well, uh, Gosford Castle out, in, out near Market Hill. Um, Park. And yes, yeah. Um, but yeah, there, you, you'll find it hard to find a, a large area of um, Northern Ireland where there weren't American soldiers. Um, a little, little side fact of that is that in 1943, with the American soldiers' arrival in County Tyrone, the population of Dungannon went up by 10%. Thanks for having me, and like I say, come along to the website. Contact me through there if you have any questions and I'll be more than happy to, to have a chat or you can come up and, and say hello now. Um, thank you. Thank you.